Oh, yeah. It is on? Oh, okay. I am, am I on the Yeah, I should be. Yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, good afternoon, everybody. I would like to welcome you to the session on arithmetization based ciphers. Uh, the first speaker is Matthias Johann Steiner. He will uh, speak on solving degree bounds for iterated polynomial systems. Okay. Yeah. So zero knowledge proof systems and multi-party computation. Yeah, that's some very nice technologies to advance to do advanced privacy preserving computations. But for efficiency they require new ciphers and test functions. And these ciphers and test functions, they are known as arithmetization-oriented primitives. And well, they have two novel design criteria. So first, they should be native of a large prime field. Okay, and the prime modulus is typically a 64-bit integer or larger. And second, these polynomials should, should exhibit a low number of multiplications for evaluation. So, and Typically, you can achieve this by utilizing low degree polynomials at round level. But this has an important consequence. Yeah? You can also model the, the cryptographic function with low degree polynomial systems. And then you could pass to generic polynomial system solving techniques like criminal bases to solve for the quantity of interest. So, okay, standard criminal basis attack okay, proceeds in four steps. You model your primitive, then you compute a Grimner basis for a degree reverse lexicographic term order. Then you perform term order conversion to a, lexicograph a lexicographic Grimner basis. And in the lexicographic, lexicographic Grimner basis, there will be at least one univariate polynomial present. Okay, and then you factor the univariate polynomial, then you have solved for one variable in your system. Yeah, and the, the, the complexity of term order Conversion and univariate factoring is well understood. So if you have a zero dimensional system, which means you have finitely many solutions, yeah, then the quotient ring is a finite dimensional K vector space. And the complexity of the term order conversion step is the dimension of the space to the power of omega, where omega is a linear algebra constant. And to factor the univariate polynomial over a finite field, you can first perform uh, uh, the greatest common divisor with respect to the field equation. yeah. And then you will reduce to just a few solutions. So the, the last factoring step is, is triggered. 
But the problem in this whole attack is step number two, so computation of the first degree reverse lexicographic grimoire basis. So the complexity of this step is only known in special cases, like the polynomial system is regular or semi-regular. If it exhibits these properties, then you have some a priori combinatorial knowledge about the system, and then you can express the complexity of Grimner basis computation with respect to some binomial coefficient. But the problem is that proving these conditions, regular or semi-regular, is very difficult. And this leads us now to, well, to the starting point of this work. Yeah? In this work, I study polynomial systems in so-called generic coordinates. So systems in generic coordinates also have a proven DRL complexity estimate. And as a first contribution, I, um, I develop a full characterization of systems in generic coordinates. And with this characterization, you can then, you can then yet get a, an efficient verification process to prove um, generic coordinates. And well, in, in the paper, I apply this verification process to, to MIMC, GMIMC, and Thetis. Unfortunately, so the, the theory of generic coordinates also has its, has its limits. So you can prove that SP and sponge functions are provable not in generic coordinates. And a similar problem we have for non-affine key schedules. And as a last contribution, um, in, the, in the paper, I study so-called polynomials with, with degree four. Yeah? So if, if you co construct a grammar basis, you do some polynomial, um, polynomial manipulations. And if you identify a polynomial with degree four, then you have an estimate from kind of a lower bound perspective, how high a degree will be in your Grimner basis computation. Okay, but now let's get a little bit into Grimner basis. So first we take a polynomial ring in n variables. Okay, and then a monomial. A monomial is a product of variables. So we can identify the, mon the monomial with its integer exponent vector, yeah? And integer vectors can be sorted. So a term order, a monomial order is just an ordering on these integer exponent vectors. And the standard examples are the lexicographic term order where the, the variables in your ring are sorted like you would lexicography sort letters in the alphabet. And then there's the degree reverse lexicographic term order where you first compare the degrees of two monomials, yeah, and if they have the same degree, then you fall back to a reverse lexicographic term order. Yeah, and for a Grimner basis, or to define Grimner basis, you take a polynomial system and you fix a term order. And with the term order, you can then define the system of leading monomials, which is the system on the left on the bottom. And now a, a final ideal basis is a Grimner basis for a term order if the system of leading monomials is generated by the limit leading monomials of your basis. Yeah, that's a Grimner basis. And you can compute them with, with rather simple linear algebra. So for this, we set up a matrix, the so-called Macaulay matrix. So we fix some term order on the ring and we fix some integer D. And now we take all monomials up to degree D, we sort them with the term order, and then we index the, the columns of the matrix via the sorted monomials. And for the rows, to index the rows, we take a, a monomial and a poly polynomial from our system such that the degree of the product is less than D. And then in the row T times F, we fill the coefficients of the polynomial D times F. And then we perform Gaussian elimination of the system. And if D is big enough, at one point you will produce a Grimner basis in the row space basis of this matrix. And the first D for which this happens, this is called the solving degree of the polynomial system. And if you know the solving degree, then you can express the complexity of Grimner basis computation as some binomial coefficient. Okay, but the problem is getting a bound on the solving degree, yeah? And well, I already mentioned, there are systems in so-called generic coordinates, which have a proven bound on the solving degree. So, and for, for this characterization of uh, polynomials in generic coordinates, we also need the notion of highest degree component of a polynomial. I mean, we take some polynomial, it's a sum of monomials, and we can sort these monomials according to the degrees. Then we can rewrite our polynomial as sum of homogeneous polynomials of different degrees. 
and the highest degree component is the is this homogeneous summit of degree D or of the degree of the polynomial. And then the equivalent, the following are equivalent. So the homogenization of a polynomial system is in generic coordinates if and only if the, the system of highest degree components has just a single solution, the point zero. Yeah? And if you are in generic coordinates, then you have a proven upper bound on the solving degree of a polynomial system, which only depends on the degree and the number of variables in the system. And this inequality in the bottom, in the, in the bottom this is known as the Macaulay bound. Yeah, and for the verification process, we, we take a look at this equivalent characterization. So this reads as the radical ideal of the highest degree component system is equal to the variance of the system. So just shortly recall the definition of radical ideal. So we take a polynomial system, yeah? Then the radical consists of all polynomials F such that the power of F is in the original system. That's the radical. And to verify generic coordinates, well, first we compute F top, the highest degree component system, and then we pick some variable. And for this variable Xi, we try to find the polynomial F, which is a power of Xi. And then when we find such a, a, a polynomial, we pass to the radical ideal, which means we add xi to the radical of f top, and in f top, we set xi to zero. And then we iterate this step for another variable. And if this is successful for all variables, then we have proven that we are in general coordinates. So, and now uh, we are going to apply this rationale to, to cryptographic polynomial systems. So the first example is the MIMSI cipher, which is a univariate cipher for MPC applications. So it's based on the cubing map or prime fields, and it's really the, the most simplest design that you can think of. We have plain text plus the key plus a variable to the power of three, and then we iterate. And well, this also admits a very simple polynomial system if you have a, a plain cipher pair of a, of a MIMC instance. Yeah. So we model the, the MIMC as a system of iterated equations. So in the first round, we have plain text plus key variable plus constant to the power of three minus x1. Next round, we have x1 plus key plus c power of three, and so on. Yeah? And now I claim that this is in generic coordinates. And for this, okay, we first compute f top of this polynomial system. So first round has just one nonlinear term, okay, or just nonlinear terms in Y. So this is going to have highest degree component Y to the power of three. And, and the, 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 lower term, the lower equations, they will have highest degree component XI plus Y to the power of three and the constant drops out. And well, to verify generic coordinates, we, we pass to the radical ideal. So we have Y to the power of three equal to zero, which implies Y equal to zero. Then we substitute Y equal to zero into here. Then we have XI to the power of three is equal to zero, which means y equal to zero in the radical. Great, okay. MIMS is in general coordinates. So we have proven formula basis complexity estimates for MIMS. So, and how do we attack MIMS? Well, if you know a little bit about Grimner basis, you might have already realized that MIMS is already a DRL Grimner basis with respect to this ordering of the variables. And now we have two possible attack strategies. So first, Okay, we take the DRL Drumler basis, compute, uh, uh, do term order conversion to Lex, and compute uh, the GCD with a univariate polynomial. And on the other hand, we could also add a field equation, let's say for the key variable to the system, and recompute the DRL Drumler basis, uh, the DRL uh, Drumler basis. And then the complexity for the last step is essentially this binomial coefficient. Okay, now okay, we have two attacks. Uh, we can compare the complexity. Well, it turns out if you do a term order conversion immediately, okay, this is at least twice as efficient as, as recomputing the global basis. Okay, so, ah, and MIMC also comes with a, with a two branch Feistel network and the Feistel hash functions. And with almost the same technique, you can also show that their iterated polynomial systems are also in generic coordinates. So we also have complexity estimates for global basis computation on these designs. So, okay, let's do, let's do the next step. Let's take a block cipher, okay. So Hades is an SPN-based cipher for MPC applications. 
And in headers, ah, okay, it's defined with a power permutation. So typically the smallest D that uh, induces a permutation over the prime field. And headers is split into so-called full rounds, yeah, where the SPN, so the power permutation is applied to all components and into partial rounds where the power permutation is only applied to the first component. And then the header cipher, well, it starts with RF full SPNs, then it performs RP partial SPNs, and then it finishes with another RF full SPNs. And again, so for headers, you can set up um, a very simple iterated polynomial system, yeah, which would look something like this. But it turns out if you, if you invert the matrices and order the variables in the right way, then you immediately produce a DL Grimner basis. Okay, how does this help? Yeah, well, as a cor corollary to the characterization of generic coordinates, if you homogenize a zero-dimensional DRL Grimner basis, you are immediately in generic coordinates, which means you have proven complexity estimates. So and then, okay, you have the following solving degree for, for the Hades Grimner basis. Just to be clear here, we already have the Hades Grimner basis. We would not recompute the Grimner basis with this basis. But in theory, an adversary could add a new polynomial to the model yeah, that encodes some information about the key variables and then recompute the basis. So in the hope that it helps solving for the keys. And then you can have two possible scenarios. So you add a nonlinear polynomial, then the solving degree bound that is written here, it can only decrease. And if you add a linear polynomial, then you can, uh, then you can, then you can, how is it? Then you can cancel one variable for free, and then this bound could decrease. Mm. So uh, this is why I call this like a baseline solving degree for, for Hades, Grimmel basis complexity estimations. And then okay, if you plug this into the binomial coefficient, you arrive at this baseline complexity estimate. And it turns out in the Hades proposal, they arrived at the same complexity estimate, but under the assumption that the polynomial system is regular or semi-regular, if you will. Okay, and then you can also use this baseline solving degree to do some complexity estimations. And as you can see, you, you only need six, round, six full rounds and 10 partial rounds to already exceed 128 bits of complexity. Okay, and um, the last primitive that I analyzed in the paper is, is GMMC, which is a generalized Feist network, also based on cubing. So, and what, what I've depicted here is the round function of, C, of GMMC with expanding uh, round function, yes. So and for GMMC, you can also prove generic coordinates, well, by, ah, actually there's a matrix multi multiplication missing here. But anyway, uh, for, for GMMC, you could prove generic coordinates by transforming the polynomial system. I mean, you can see here, the nonlinear component is always in Xn to the power of three. Yeah? So you fix one nonlinear equation, and with this fixed equation, you cancel xn to the power of three in the other equation. Then you, if you pass to the highest degree component system for one round, you will obtain n minus one linear equation and xn to the power of three. Yeah. So to verify generic coordinates for GMMC, you essentially you have to do Gaussian elimination on some matrix. If the matrix has full rank, you and generic coordinates, then you have proven complexity estimates. And if, if GMMC is in general coordinates, then you have this solving degree and this complexity estimate. And well, in the GMMC proposal, they didn't study iterated GMMC polynomial system, but they considered only polynomial systems in N key variables where all the rounds are substituted into each other. And then they arrive at this complexity estimate. And now we can compare what's more efficient, Grimner basis computations on an iterated model or on a fully substituted model. Yeah, it turns out using an iterated model is slightly faster. Um, yeah, and, and uh, the strategy to, to prove generic coordinates for, uh, for GMMC, we are, we, are verifying, we are verifying the rank of a linear system, generalizes also to other types of Feistel networks. Ah, so, okay, we are at the end, so, Okay, in the paper, okay, I developed the full characterization of generic coordinates, okay, it gives you an efficient criterion. And then this yields proven complexity estimates for various designs, yeah. But now there's still kind of open problems in this whole theory. So first problem, so in the recent years, a lot of designs has, have been 
a lot of arithmetization designs have been de developed. And ideally, we, we would like to have poor complexity estimates for all of these designs. Second problem is that, well, sponge functions are provable. SPN sponge functions are provable, not in generic coordinates. So DRL Gromner basis computations on them, they are black box, so we don't know. And the last thing is, so the, the Macaulay bound depends only on the number of, uh, on, on the degrees and the, and the, and the number of, of, of variables in a system. And, well, how to say it? Uh, unfortunately, it stays constant, it, it is constant, independent, independent of how many polynomial systems you add to your system, yeah? So ideally, if you have hugely overdefined systems, we would be very interested in to, ha to have solving degree upper bounds that improve upon the Macaulay bound. Okay, now we have finished. Thank you. Do we have questions? Yes, Dimitri. Uh, hello, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, when you say you have proven complexity estimates, yeah. do you mean you have proven an upper bound? Upper bound, yes. Okay. Uh, do you uh, see any way of uh, kind of reasoning the lower bound? Yeah, I mean that's actually what I do in this paper. So with with this notion of polynomials with degree four, which should be on this slide. So what is a polynomial with degree four? We take a polynomial system F, yeah, and some D, and we pick a polynomial of degree less than D. And we say that F has a degree four if it's in the row space of the Macaulay matrix of degree D, but not in the Macaulay matrix of degree D minus one. So essentially this means you need polynomials of degree D to construct this F, but F has a lower degree. Okay. And then you can define this notion, a notion of last four degree, which is the highest degree where such a degree for a polynomial can occur. So good news for in generic coordinates, this last four degree is always finite. And for MIMC, I was able to identify such polynomials with degree four. So you take an S polynomial, assume it has a degree four, and then from, from MIMC, I then transformed to a lexicographic Gromner basis, compared the degrees of univariate polynomials, and then arrived at the contradiction. And if you identify such a polynomial with a degree four, then you have an estimate on the lowest theoretical achievable complexity estimate in a theory of generic coordinates. So it's not a full lower bound of the solving degree, but it's it would be like a lower bound on the best possible estimation at the moment. So very technical answer. Okay, another quick question. So did you uh, compare your uh, complexities with uh, the best attacks on MIMC, which are on higher order differentials? Yeah, so uh, so one simple attack to, to improve MIMC is to, to don't construct a lexicographic grammar basis with FGLM algorithms, but mm -hmm. construct it via fast universal polynomial multiplication. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but it's it's hard to compare to these statistical attacks because these Gromner based attacks they're in a in a low data scenario and then you have a high data scenario. So I'm 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 more interested in one plane cipher pair, two plane cipher pairs. Yeah, but I, I should stress something. So so in this paper, my main goal was to to outline a process. Yeah, how we can arrive at provable complexity estimates. Yes. And once we have that, okay, then we go to the next step and try to get the best possible. I think detection. it's okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So let's thank the speaker again. So our next speaker is Lorenzo Grassi. So Lorenzo will speak on bounded surjective quadratic functions over FP to the N or MPC 
CKFHE friendly symmetric primitives. Okay, thanks, Vicky, for the introduction. So, as we just saw, there are many semantic primitives that have been uh, proposed for uh, this application, like multiparty computation, full morphic encryption, and zero knowledge. And um, almost all of them are proposed over prime fields, and they always try to minimize the number of multiplication, usually the number of multiplication that you need to verify them or to compute them. Now, what's interesting is that uh, for security reason, almost all of, all of them are instantiated via invertible components or via permutation. What I mean is, for example, you have a SPN scheme and the SBOX is a power map and it's a power map is invertible. Or in some cases, this power map is not invertible, like the square map, but is used in a, in a, a file style mode or in a lame messy mode such that uh, you get a permutation. At the same time, we don't need invertibility. So for zero knowledge, for example, we need a hash function, which is not invertible, you have collision. And for multi-party computation or fully morphic encryption, you need a PRF, which is not invertible by definition. So, okay, you can set up like a sponge, you can instantiate a sponge via permutation, you can set up a PRF via permutation, but that's actually not necessary for our goal. So the question that I would like to face in this presentation and in this paper is the following. So, what happens if we remove the invertibility condition? So what happens if we work with uh, non-invertible components, with non-invertible functions? So can we improve the cost at the same time? Can we uh, get the same security level? And as I'm going to show, this is indeed possible. So first of all, I'm going to define what I mean by bounded subjective function. And then I start to propose some, some examples. So I don't want to propose new scheme. I want to show how to modify uh, existing scheme by using non-invertible component. For example, I start with MIMC and I'm going to propose this MIMC++. Then I need uh, to show how to set up this bounded subjective function over F to the N. And then I'm going to use this result on other MIMC. And I'm going to conclude with some open problems. So I guess every one of you know what a subjective function is. So we have a function and every output uh, admits at least one per image. So we have a lower bound on the number of per images. What I want is an upper bound on the number of pre-images. So I say that a function is L bounded surjective if every output admits, uh, at, admit at most uh, L pre-images. So just a couple of results that I'm going to use in the following. So if I have a function F that is L bounded surjective and the function G that is lambda bounded surjective, then the composition it is, more, is at most L times lambda bounded surjective. And if I have a function f that is L bounded subjective, we can also estimate, uh, give an upper bound on the probability that we get a collision at the output, which is the ratio between L minus one and the cardinality of X minus one. You can also get better bound, but that's not necessary for what I'm going to do. Okay, so let's start with MIMC. So we already saw in Matthias' slide. So MIMC is quite simple. We have uh, a uh, round function, in this case, cube map. But in general, we have a power map where the exponent uh, is co-prime with p minus one in order to be invertible. We have key addition, constant addition, and that's basically it. So if we want a security of kappa bit, where well, yeah, I'm assuming that kappa is log two of p, and we also have this uh, data complexity limit, then the number of round is approximately uh, kappa times log two in base t. So some concrete numbers, if you want uh, 120 bits of security and this is equal to three, we need uh, 73 rounds. Now what happens? So we can use MIMC in the encryption direction, everything works. But uh, if, you work, if you use MIMC in the, in the encryption direction, that's super expensive because the inverse of uh, X to the three is super expensive. So what we actually do is to use MIMC in counter mode. So we use MIMC in this way which means that basically we don't need, we don't use the invertibility of MIMC. So what we can do is just to replace this generic power map with a square map. So and I define this MIMC++ like MIMC associated with the square map. So if you, have, if you want kappa, uh, kappa bit of security level, um, the number of round is again proportional to kappa. So it's kappa minus some constant. But I also assume that P is quite large. So I assume that P is larger than two to, two to the power of three times kappa. So which means that for example, if you want 128 bits of security, we have 117 rounds, but P is very large. So it's approximately two to the power of 384. So what's the reason of this? 
But if you consider the security, the security analysis of MIMC and MIMC++, they are quite similar. Uh, in both cases, the GCD is the most powerful attack. But um, the main difference arises from the fact that MIMC++ is not invertible. So at the output of MIMC++, you can get collision. Now we know that uh, each round is of degree two, so it's two bound is surjective. So MIMC++ is to the arc bound is surjective, so we can estimate the probability of collision in this way. And we get that uh, having a collision at the output is approximately to the power of minus two kappa. And with this um, data limit, uh, basically we can say that um, observing a collision is unrealistic. Now we want to set up a PRF, so actually we are not afraid of collision, but the point is that uh, you can potentially exploit this collision to set up a key recovery attack. So it's not completely clear how to do that. So for security reason, I just chose to have a very large prime. But I think it's quite interesting to understand better how uh, this works. And the other difference regarding the polynomial representation. Now, if you work in the forward direction, no big difference. So the polynomial is dense and the degree grows as to the power of R. But if you go in the backward direction, well, some problem arises. So as we know, the square map is not invertible, but we can set up local inverses. For example, if P is equal to three modulo four, then we have these two inverses, plus and minus X to the power of P plus one divided by four. So what can we observe? That first of all, okay, we have local inverses, but usually these local inverses have very high degree. And second of all, I mean, if we want to combine local inverses over multiple round, that's quite difficult to do because you have to be very careful with the domain and the codomain of, the, uh, of these local inverses. So what I conjecture is that few rounds are sufficient to prevent this algebraic attack in the backward direction. But again, I mean, it's not completely clear how to do that. So I think uh, that could be a very interesting open problem to, uh, to study. So if you have a look at the complexity uh, for 128 bit of security, then we have that MIMC++ has obviously more rounds compared to MIMC, but the number of multiplication is uh, much smaller. So it's approximately, uh, so this number has at least 25% more. So by using square operation instead of invertible uh, power maps, allows us to reduce the number of multiplication. Okay, the, the, the prime is much larger, but in MPC application, that's not so important. At the same time, it's true that in some application, we cannot show the prime. So we need to set up some uh, bounded subjective function over FP to them. So the trivial idea could be, okay, we have the square map. We can just apply the square map on each component. But in general, this is not a good idea for two reasons. First of all, the number of collision is quite high. So it's approximately two to the power of n divided by p to the power of n. We can do much better. And second of all, we can do key recovery. So we can easily set up a collision by noting that uh, a collision is, is uh, of this form. So we can keep like, for example, n minus one component constant. We can guess the key in watch component and we can use collision to uh, do key filtering. So this is not a good approach. What I, what I instead propose is to use uh, a result that we proposed last year at FAC. So the idea is to have a function a local function that takes an input M element and return a single element in output. And we want to set up a function based on this on FP to the N, which is defined in this way. So each output, uh, YI, is defined as the local map applied to XI, XI plus one, and so on. For example, the chi function in Keshek uh, follows this definition. So we have a function, a local function that takes an input three bits, return a single bit in output, uh, and chi is defined in this way. Now, if we work over a prime fields and f is a quadratic function, then we proved this result last year. So if m is equal to two, then this function is never invertible for each n bigger equal than three. And if m is equal to three, then this function again is never invertible for n bigger equal than five. So if you want invertible function, that's a problem. But here we are working with non-invertible functions. So that's absolutely fine for us. And we want to focus on this case. So m equal to two. So, and in the paper, we look for quadratic function that takes an in input two elements and turn a single element that minimize the number of collision in the corresponding uh, shift invariant lifting function SF, and it also minimize the multiplicative complexity. And the function that uh, satisfies these two conditions is quite simple. So it's uh, x1 to the power of two plus x0 
or affine equivalence of these or x0 squared plus x1. So we prove that the probability that you get a collision at the output is at most two, the power, two divided by e to the n. So we don't have the, the exponent n here. Uh, most interesting, if you look for a collision, then you can set up a non-trivial collision only in the case in which all components are different. So you really need that xi is different from yi for each index i. And finally, uh, the corresponding function sf is to the power of n bounded subjective. Okay, so we have this result. So let's apply on a concrete block cipher. And the idea is to apply it to Addis Mimsi. Again, Matthias already presented it. So just briefly, we have two different rounds. So round with full S box layer at the beginning and at the end, a round with partial S box layer in the middle. Uh, the S box is again a power map. The linear layer is a multiplication with MDS matrix. And the number of round is this one. So we have three round at the, at the beginning, three round at the end. And in the middle, we have approximately log P in base D uh, partial rounds. Again, the power map is very expensive if you consider the inverse. We don't want to use decryption. So what we actually did was to use other BMC in counter mode. And the problem, as you can understand, are these rounds that are very expensive. So each one of these rounds costs at least two times n multiplication. So each S box costs at least two multiplication. But we need this round. We need because they allows us for very simple security argument against statistical attacks. For example, we can use the white redesign strategy for showing security against differential linear attacks. And at the same time, they also mask the internal accounts. So they are crucial also for, from the algebraic point of view. But what we can do is to replace these power maps with this uh, function that we just found. So if you have a look, it's more or less a file style. But in a five style, like a five, uh, five style type three, in a five style type three, you have one component that basically is linear. Here, you don't have this component. So you apply this map uh, uh, X square everywhere. So the nice thing of this uh, layer is that it costs only N multiplication. So we already save N multiplication per round. I also change a bit the internal round. So I replace uh, the power map with uh, a degree four lemma say scheme that we already use in Hydra, but that's not very important for this presentation, just to mention it. And um, the nice thing is that the security of this new scheme and of Addis MIMC are very similar. So you can really move the argument from Addis MIMC to this new one. The main differences are again, the collision probability. But if you show uh, the parameter in a good way, you can guarantee that the collision probability is very low. And the other point is that the external round are not invertible which is okay because I mean, now we have uh, internal rounds that have degree four in both direction. So the fact that the last rounds are not invertible or if you want the uh, uh, local inverses with very high degree allows us to uh, guarantee security against meeting the middle attacks. So if you have a look at the two scheme, so with Addis MIMC, we have six round, six external round. With this new version that I call Pluto, we have eight external round, but still we can gain from the multiplicative uh, complexity point of view. So in general, Addis MIMC even for small values of N uh, is more expensive than Pluto of a percentage of around 25%. Okay, so I show that um, we can improve the performances of this scheme by using uh, non-invertible, uh, non-linear maps. But see, there are quite some open problems to, to analyze and to study. So in particular, how to use, for example, collision to set up efficient recovery attacks, or for example, how to uh, exploit the local inverses to set up uh, meeting the middle algebraic attacks. And before to conclude, I would like to uh, do this remark. So we discussed the use of low degree non bijective component for designing symmetric primitives in which the internal state is not obfuscated by a secret like a key. So what it means, if you want to set up a sponge hash function, don't use these uh, non-invertible uh, low degree functions because you can set up a collision in the in a few rounds by just solving a, a low degree system of equations. So we just use this uh, this function carefully or in the case where you have a key. And that's it from my side. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. We have time for questions. Yes. 
Hi. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I was curious, you mentioned that you're focused here on this, uh, decreasing the number of multiplications in these schemes. I was wondering, you presented a uh, decrease uh, really on the mathematical side, but do you also have preliminary results on uh, implementations and uh, figuring out whether these uh, uh, new schemes actually implemented are also faster than the other schemes? Uh, no, I actually didn't implement them. Um, so MIMC is more a toy cipher, I would say. At least MIMC is also not the most competitive design at the moment, like uh, Hydra is more competitive. So um, it's possible that uh, you can modify like Hydra by using this technique and improving it. I actually show an example in the paper. But for these two uh, for these two cases, I didn't implement, so I didn't really check uh, what happens. Okay, thank you. Some more questions? Hey, thanks for your presentation. Um, I was wondering about this function x1 to the power 2 plus x0 that is currently used in Monolith, right? In the bricks layer? Yeah. OK. But uh, I, in that case, it's a type 3 file. So one of the component is linear, so it's invertible. Uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit different. OK. That also is a sponge. So it's a hash function. We don't have any secret, and we don't want to use a non-invertible uh, layer. OK, that's the, the difference I was looking for. Thank You're you. Right. Even more questions? So in that case, uh, let's thank Lorenzo again. Thank you. Our next speaker is Xiao Chen. So you see, you see the list of co-authors, and the title is Towards the Links of Cryptanalytic Methods on MPC, FAG, CK-Friendly Symmetric Key Primitives. OK, uh, thanks for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm Xu Yao from Nyan Technology University. And today, my, talk, my presentation is about the Links of cryptanalytic methods on MPC FHGK friendly symmetry key primitives. This is a joint work with Chen Jian and Li, a Mei Qing, Pu Wen, and Zhe Yu. And my presentation is in four parts. So we we'll first look at the motivation of this work. So in recent years, with the first developments of these advanced cryptographic uh, applications and protocols, such as the um, multiple computation, the fully homomorphic encryption, and zero knowledge proof systems, uh, it has led to some new requirements for the underlying primitives, especially the symmetry primitives. So with this new with this new custom metrics, many new uh, fail friendly ciphers uh, proposed with the novel operations and the constructions. So naturally, this new design ideas may also lead to some potential threats. For example, the, the Grubner basis attack on the Jarvis and Freddy, the high order differential attack on the Furan Mimisi, and the coefficient grouping breaks the Chuckley. Yeah. And so on. So there are also some statistical attacks, but uh, compared to the algebraic base attack, um, seems less. But for example, the truncate differential attacks on the GMMC, and so on. So cryptanalysis and design of these newly symmetry case efforts are becoming interesting, but also a challenging task. First, the cryptanalysis definitely needs to be investigated further. And uh, this, of course, in, in turn, could help the designers have a more in-depth understanding of the security and which can, which can help to improve the performance further. Yeah, to now, it seems that these novel symmetry designs are more vulnerable to the algebraic attacks. So however, to accurately evaluate the algebraic property of this new cipher is still difficult. So for here, the algebraic properties we more refer to the, the integral, for example, the, the integral distinguisher or something, 
uh, rather than the algebraic uh, the group number basis that we square of different. And but according to the previous masses, the presentation, it seems like the the algebraic the group number basis that also is also very promising to analysis such ciphers. So uh, in this paper, we more focus on the 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 as we say the about the integral group analysis. So there are usually two measures to evaluate the such integral properties. So one is a degree-based measure, the another one is the structure-based measure. And in this paper, we limit ourselves to the structure-based. So according to the experiences of for the whole research community over the afternoon that was to Bannerfeld, it seems that the links can be a, could be a very useful tool to to do deduce to reveal such underlying structural properties. For example, we, which has been actually have been well studied for these years. And here, for example, we provide a illustration of the links among impossible differential and zero correlation and the and integrals criminals over the banner field, which is a first they proposed by Sun et al. The, in their crypto 2015 paper. So here to to analysis to analysis such underlying relation between different criminals, we first need to introduce a concept of a, a what is the structure. So structure is a definition we introduce to abstract a, a cipher without considering the details of the nonlinear layers or the linear layers, for example, for a AES structure, we can replace the AESS box to some other ABS box and the MDS matrix some to some other MDS matrix, but the cipher still belongs to the AES structure. So with this structure, we now, if we have a impossible differential trails for a structure, they prove we can unconditionally lead to convert it to a zero correlation linear linear hard to a of a its dual structure. The dual structure is is a also another is the definition from the structure that we swap the operations, the branch operation and the extra operation. So so now we have a zero correlation linear hard of the dual structure and soon the that this can be directly and conditionally implies the integral distinguisher of this dual structure. And if we can find some a fine equivalent, equivalent relation of the structure and dual structure, with this one also can lead back to the structure itself for you as a integral distinguisher and thus a closed past. And and Haribo also mentioned this this link in the his his talk this morning. So this naturally leads to why we focus on the links over the all prime field. In this, so integral analysis over IP is still difficult to evaluate, and for impossible differential and this correlation might be easier to construct. So if we can have such links among the edicities and the and over IP, we then can derive the structure based in this integral distinguisher more convenient. Okay, so now we briefly introduce how and what we have established for the links over the prime field. As we can see, the brain strain, uh, bigness and strain in one day in 2007 already provide, provide us a, a generalized a correlation definition over such a all prime field. So for, for with the more generalized a defined of this character over the prime field, we can have this generalized the de correlation definition over the prime field. And this field is actually defined over a complex plane and then directly related to the prime number we choose. And uh, compared to the correlation definition over the bandwidth field where the parity check is can be 
already can be extremely used for its capacity calculation. The, to evaluate such correlation over the FP seems, seems more complicated. So we also, as far as we know, only until the recent design dominion, the designers try to evaluate such security against this kind of linear text over the opera field. So uh, with this more generalized the, the correlation definition over the opera field, we still can see that the balanced property and their correlation they build the, some similarities. Essentially, they both focus on the distribution of the part of the output with given a proper input space. So we, we must say the ZC and the INT are still, are still the core connection. We want to have the links between the opera and fail. So uh, having, this in, having this in mind, we, we, we first need to prove the, prove the links of the between the ZC and NT over IP. So we for the directions of from from DC to NT over IP, we have this we prove the serum. And uh, for example, we're first to have a, a linear zero correlation linear heart here. And with the help of the uh, help function, we can prove that for any proper five lambda belongs to this uh, we can have this balanced property. Uh, compared to the conditions over the benefit, actually in the first, in 2012, the uh, Andrew Bogdanov, the, uh, they already claimed that the input and output linear max in the recollection approximations are, should be independent to have such conversion. Later, this condition was relaxed by shunning their crypto paper. However, during our proofs for, for this direction, we found that it, required, it still requires subspace for the input mass when transforming this into NT. And, and we found this corresponds to the results of Bain's 2021 issue crypto paper. And in that paper, he already provided us a new insights into the linear crop analysis over our building groups and generalized the links between the circulation and the integral text which are actually obtained by introducing a very novel and high-level geometric approach. And our results seems obtained from a first start from the bottom. So for the, for the direction from the integral to zero collation, uh, we found it's similar to that over the banner field, that only the NTV's balance property can be converted back to the ZS over that field. So uh, now we have the core links between the ZC and the ORP. For the links between the IDC and ZC, we still follow the similar framework over the banner field, but we also cover more cons construction and, uh, and uh, the underlying, more underlying structures. For example, the inverse structure here. For example, if we have an IDC on the structure, if so, it can be, can, can be converted to a, as they say, belongs to this the dual structure. And then they derive the integral distinction. If we can find some other underlying equivalent relations of this inverse structure or, it, or even the structure itself, we now can get a one co one to one corresponding distinguishers. Thus, more refined links between the NDC, ZC, and NT over the prime field that established. Okay, now we talk about some applications uh, to GMMC. Yeah, so here we only show the results to two uh, versions of given by the GMMC designer. They actually proposed the four constru constructions and they, so we now focus on, we only show the results on GMMC with the expanding run function and the compressing run function, which are due to each other. So we first adopt the algebraic equation based measure to find the IDC and the ZC first. Then we use the step sheet links to convert it the to to go to obtain the ND directly from this to the, the IDC or DC. And improvements up to three rounds for most cases. 
and upstream number rounds of uh, for for some special and limited cases are also obtained. Yeah, this is the the results we what we have on the Jimmy CRF and the CRF. So and Kelly noted this is the special arbitrary number of rounds IDC we obtained, which show a difference between the uh upright field FP and the not and the banner field. We'll talk about it later. So with this is a for the algebraic a equation based system. We just uh, propagate the input and output difference variables as much as possible, but only introduce some new variables when passing the nonlinear layers. Then we can meet in the middle as some intermediate state to set up a equation system, and then we can start to get some condition or some variables. For example, here we get a beta three to be zero. However, beta three is actually propagated from the beta two, and beta two is coming from the beta one. Well, in Jimmy Big ERV, because the S is a permutation, so that means this difference propagated from the beta one should be not zero. Then this lead to a contradiction and identify a, a impossible differential for three, three D minus one rounds. So, and if we with the bus uh, equation based systems, we now add two extra conditions. One is the alpha one equals to a the negative beta one and the t minus one modulo p equals to zero. So then for any rounds impossible differential system what we have shown in previous page, we now will have these equations. And remember that we have this extra condition, then this system, this equation will cancel to alpha one equals to beta one, then combined with this equation we set in on the input difference, we then can lead to a, a another a new contradiction on the say any run any number of rounds impossible differential can be obtained. Okay, come to a, a short conclusion. So uh, links over the prime field can be useful to us for design and cryptanalysis for of these newly MPC and security friendly ciphers and more algebraic properties of the symmetric ciphers over API are also expected to be investigated, especially the group number basis attacks. And, and novel nonlinear operations uh, could also be explored for example, the recent complete analysis of the quadratic functions. I think if these more properties of these non-linear operations can be combined with the structural properties, maybe more interesting result uh, expected. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you. Do you have questions? So I have one question. Do you think that your uh, methods would be applicable to the new design of the previous talk? Previous talk? Oh, uh, actually, I think it depends on the, really depends on the construction. For example, if, if we concentrate, focus on some SPN constructions with the very high Diffusion matrix and then linear layer something I think is might be difficult. Okay. Yeah. Some more questions. So if not, let's thanks. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.